30 years ago, the first ever Hay Festival took place, and since then, it's developed into a worldwide literary festival which attracts a mass of visitors every year, as well as a variety of authors. Now, one of those authors who's visiting for the first time this year is theoretical physicist and director of Arizona State University's Origins Project, Professor Lawrence Krauss, who has kindly agreed to sit down with me for 10 minutes or so to talk about science and stuff. So, uh, let's go and see if we can find him. So we're here now with Professor Krauss. Professor Krauss, thank you so much it's for joining us. It's good to be us. here with you. Um, your new book, mm -hmm. The Greatest Story Ever Told So Far, is the name. Now, that's quite a claim, don't you think? <laughs> I mean, we've had a lot of incredible stories throughout human history. What makes yours so great? Well, it's a takeoff on the title of a, of a movie. Uh, it, often the Bible story is called The Greatest Story Ever Told So Far. And, and not The Greatest Story Ever Told So Far, The Greatest Story Ever Told. And I think I wanted to make it clear that the story of the real universe is far more interesting than the, than the Bible story because it's actually real. Mm, yes, and, indeed. Uh, and, and also it changes all the time. The so far part is the really important thing. The story gets better every day because we discover new things. Mm. And it surprises us. And it's not based on human imagination. It's based on the imagination of nature, which, is, which far exceeds human imagination. And I wanted to show that this story has a long history, right? It starts with Plato and it goes right through human history of trying to understand our place in the universe and how we got here. It's, yes. I don't think there's any more deep question than, than, than uh, why are we here? Why are we here, exactly. Absolutely. Now, some of the discoveries that you mention in the book, one thing I've noticed is that um, a lot of the time they're met with controversy. So when people are stared, there's people staring evidence in the face, mm -hmm. what do you think it is? that makes it so difficult for people to change their worldview, even when uh, the evidence is undeniably standing in front of them? Well, I think humans are, you know, they, they retreat to the safety of what they know. And uh, I think uh, the, the great thing about the, the story is, in some sense, is that you see that scientists are human, which is really interesting. But right. the science supersedes the biases, the prejudices, the pig-headedness of humans. And I think um, uh, one of the, one of the sentences I used at the end of the book is from the Aeneid, that's uh, uh, the second sentence actually, which, which is release your fear. I think there's fear of the unknown. And I, I think, so it's just hard for people to, we, we are myopic, we want to believe, we want to believe that what we know and what we experience is the whole universe. And, and the great thing about science is it teaches us that, that the universe of our experience may not be the entire universe, that we have to get rid of our cosmic myopia. Yeah, I think it's a case of... I, I don't know about you, but I found that having your mind change and having your worldview challenge isn't just not scary. It's also it's fascinating. Once well, you it's allow, liberating. You, I yeah, often exactly. say to students that the one thing that I hope to, happens to every student at some point in their career is to have some idea that they hold so dear to their being that it, it's, it seems a part of their central being yes. proved to be wrong. Yeah. Because that's the experience of, of growing up. That's the experience of learning. And it's a wonderful experience. It's, it's, what, it's what's made being human more interesting over time. Mm. I wonder, has anything that uh, significant ever happened to you? Is there anything that you can think of? Um, well, I know that you, as your job, you discover things, especially with the yeah. work you're doing with the Origins Project. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, I, mean, I think one of my discoveries that I made initially, was, which has now been true, was something I really didn't believe when I first, when I first wrote it down, which right. is that the energy of empty space is the dominant energy of the universe. That, I, I, I wrote a paper about that, but mostly because I thought the data was wrong. I thought the only way to explain <laughs> this is to have this energy of empty space, and it explained everything. But I was sure that that was wrong, and then it was discovered to be right. It was remarkable, and yeah. it's changed our view of everything. You know, often I've written many scientific papers that I could have written a decade earlier, but until the actual experiment is done, you don't think about things the same way. The, the reality of new discoveries primes your mind to think in a new way, and it's a wonderful for me. Yes. Of course, it's, that's been true in my personal life, too. Uh, one of the wonderful things about travel, for example, is discovering that what you think is normal and natural where you are is not normal <laughs> and natural anywhere else. Yes, it's one of the great yeah, virtues yeah, yeah. of traveling. Absolutely. Um, but speaking of people who are wrong about things or think they're wrong about things, <laughs> I want to say a contention that's often put to me mm -hmm. is one of science. Now, I'm not a scientist. I'm a science enthusiast, yeah. so it's a good opportunity to put these questions to a real scientist. Yeah. Um, I know exactly how I'd respond to this, but I'm interested. Uh, You've probably heard it before, this idea, well, thousands of years ago, science thought the Earth was flat. Yeah. Thousands of years ago, science thought all things that were wrong. Einstein discovered that yeah. Isaac Newton was completely wrong, and he himself well, thought that the universe was static. How do you know that what we know now won't be disproved Well, that's the years? point. Einstein didn't discover that, Einstein, that Newton was completely wrong. Newton was yes. completely right, and Einstein knew <laughs> it. As far as the motion of cannonballs, cricket balls, and even spacecraft around the Earth, 
What the biggest misconception about science is that scientific revolutions do away with everything that went before them. That's exactly wrong. What satisfies the test of experiment today will be right a million years from now. Whatever we discover about quantum gravity in the early universe, if you take a ball here and, and hold it, it won't fall off, it'll fall down and be described by, as Galileo described it, and Newton described it. So, so it's true that our ideas evolve and change. They change as a result of experiments. But those ideas that have sort of satisfied the test of experiment over and over again don't, uh, uh, will always be right in the domain in which they apply. Yes. Our, our fundamental understanding of the context of those laws may change. But science is not just a fad. That's, mm. the, that's the really important thing. Yes. The, the, the Big Bang, the, the evidence we have the Big Bang happened is not going to mean that a million years from now we won't think the Big Bang happened. Our understanding of it, the origins and the future may be quite different. Mm. Yes, until the time when uh, everything's been blown so far apart that but we the, won't be able to even Yeah, know. well, then when we'll be gone and the universe yes, won't really care about us, which is one of the, the contexts of the book <laughs> is really is that the universe of our experience is not only an illusion, but it's an accident. It's a remarkable concept. Yes. I like the accident. It'll be around for a little while, and then the phrase you use on the very first page, the idea that uh, our understanding is just another sort of chapter. It's just another yeah, it's another chapter. Mm. And, and we tend to think the universe sort of evolved to this point, and it's always going to be this way, and we're the, we're the ultimate state of the universe, but we're just, uh, we're just a phase. Yeah, we're not and, the end goal. We're yeah, just, and this too shall pass. Yeah. We're on the path. Um, now I wonder, when you do come across people who are wrong about things, mm -hmm. um, when people have bad ideas. Are you the sort of person to, to give credence to the idea of saying, well, that's ridiculous and here's why? Or are you more the sort of person to explore it and say, well, if we, if we follow this along the logic you're proposing, this is why you might be wrong? Well, I think the, way, the only way you can teach people, and the only way you learn, is by confronting your own mis misconceptions. So as a teacher, I like to, I like to help people follow on their own misconceptions right. and discover for themselves why things are wrong. Sometimes. Sometimes, though, it's, I think it's really important to confront people and say, this is a ridiculous idea. Why, why do you think it's true? Mm. You have to provoke them to think. And, and sometimes, um, you know, it's great to point out the, the paradoxes and contradictions of the idea. But I think um, confronting people uh, with confronting ideas and even ridiculing ideas is not, not always bad. Uh, as long as you shouldn't ridicule people. But ideas are subject to discussion, humor. Uh, yes. Nothing should be sacred. Yeah, uh, it's exactly what I say all the time. I, I, I don't know about you, I find that humour particularly is yeah. particularly um, effective at criticism, even if it's unintentional. I yeah, yeah, no, hu that. well, I use humour all the time, so yes. I think humour is a good way to break the ice and also overcome people's fears as well. Absolutely. So. Um, now, conscious of time, because I know that you have to go and give a speech, which hopefully I'll be uh, attending. Uh, I hope you'll be, very be attending, yeah. Um, but finally, I just want to put this to you again, because uh, I know firsthand that there is a community of individuals out there who are just beginning to discover uh, reality. They're just beginning to read and they're just becoming to uh, discover science. Now, every, every generation. Happens, absolutely. Yeah. But yeah. our current climate, as I'm sure you would agree, is particularly filled with nonsense and, uh, and misleading ideology. So what advice would you have for people who are wanting to uh, learn about truths, especially when you have global warming denying evolution? Well, I think, I think the point is, first of all, we, we, part of it re resides in the fact that we teach science the wrong way. We teach it as an accumulation of facts. It isn't. It's a process for deriving facts. And so what I advise those people to do is to learn the process of science and teachers to teach the process of science. Skeptical questioning, reliance on empirical evidence, testing, further testing, multiple sources, that's the way science progresses. And it's the way we need in our society right now to address the global challenges of the world. When politicians say something, demand empirical evidence. And, and, and we should need to require that in public policy. So I think to learn the tools of science is important, not just to learn science, but to, but to help us uh, understand the world and, and, and deal with the challenges we face in public policy. Arch Krauss. Thank, Thank you, you so much for joining me. Thank you. And good luck with your talk. Thank you very much. That was great. So there we have it. Lawrence Krauss now knows who I am. A genuinely nice guy, too. Uh, and his lecture was pretty captivating. If you want to buy his new book, The Greatest Story Ever Told So Far, uh, which is a great read, then one of my fancy Amazon affiliate links will be available in the description. I want to say thank you to Tim Durkin, uh, Gabriel Michael, Robbie McKinnon, and Matthew Senzon, who made this experience run a lot more smoothly. Um, and of course, I want to thank Professor Lawrence Krauss for taking the time to sit down with me, and uh, thank you for watching, as always, and I will see you in the next one.